So what we would like to do in this course is to go to that boundary where, um, where um, quantum field theory um, starts to break down, the boundary between, um, between high energy quantum field theory and ultra high energy quantum field theories. Um, and this is what we call the ultraviolet. And we would like to understand um, what would constitute a ultraviolet completion of quantum field theory. So that's, that's the way I, I tend to view um, string theory. Um, and as such, you would probably surmise then that, that my view of string theory is, is very similar to, um, um, to the way I view quantum field theory. Um, and so it doesn't make any sense to go off and, and learn, well, it did at some point to me, but um, you know, today my, my view I'd like to think is a little more mature, um, which is that to, to really get a deep understanding of string theory, its successes, its problems, where it works, where it doesn't work, um, you, you have to have a good solid handle on quantum field theory first. And to have a good solid handle on quantum field theory, and certainly in the quantum field theory um, that, is, that lives on the world sheet of the string, um, you need to understand the natural language in which to describe this. And the natural language to describe this is the language of path integrals, which is why in the last two years, I've um, tended to focus this course largely on exploring um, path integration. So if you're seeing um, that path integral methods dominate the course outline here, it's for a good reason. It's, it's the learning to walk that, that, that we need to do before we, can, before we can learn to run. Now, if you have not taken a course in quantum field theory, or you are currently taking a course in quantum field theory as is offered maybe by Will Horowitz in physics, um, this course is slightly different in the sense that um, <clears throat> I'm going to be focusing on, on a complementary language in which to describe quantum fields that actually doesn't require you to understand much about um, the, 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 you know, the quantum fields themselves. That's because in the language of path integrals, um, quantum fields look classical. And so much of what we're going to be working with is functional calculus. So I'd really like you if you have if you don't have a good grounding in functional calculus, this is um, uh, actions, Euler Lagrange equations, etc., um, to to go back and revise that um, that content. Now, much of my notes for this um, course are in my um, in my lecture notes and to tools for mathematical physics, um, which um, I will upload to the Vula page. And for those of you who are external to uh, UCT in this in this um, course or auditing the, the the course, I will send you an email with the, with it as well. It's the same set of notes that I use for uh, uh, topics in mathematical uh, in mathematical physics, and so um, uh, you, you'll you'll see the same thing there as well. So we're going to start off by looking at um, at path integral methods in a, in a setting which should be familiar to most of you, which is um, quantum mechanics. And so quantum mechanics in this sense is viewed as a quantum field theory in zero plus one dimensions, that is only time dependence. Um, and from there, we'll, we'll touch on the interpretation of some of the results in path integral methods um, in the language of statistical mechanics, which will be a, which will play a very important role in what we're about to to in the journey we're about to take. Um, <clears throat> as a slight side interest, I will introduce the idea of um, doing path integrals on spaces that are topologically non-trivial. So, for example, if I take a plane and I puncture the plane, um, then I then I have a homotopically non-trivial um, space that's topologically non-trivial <coughs> because I've cut a point out of it, um, and I'll show you how to um, how to study uh, particles, quantum particles moving in this space through the path integral language. Really, one of the beautiful things about path integration um, is how to view how it views perturbation theory. So we will set up perturbation theory in the simplest model we can find. Um, which is a free quantum field theory. And then we'll, we'll, we'll show how you can go from the free theory 
and perturb a way to a non-trivial um, theory. And this will set up for us a sort of a Taylor expansion that we call in physics um, perturbation theory. Um, and I'll show how, these, how this perturbation theory leads naturally to a set of diagrammatic rules called the Feynman rules, um, <clears throat> which will allow us to compute observables in the theory. Because that's really the name of the game, is trying to calculate um, observable quantities that we can then go and give to our experimental friends. Um, <clears throat> Once we're done with the perturbation theory, I will move on and, um, and introduce the idea of symmetries, um, classical symmetries, and how these classical symmetries are coded in, 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 in quantized systems. And um, then we'll, we, we might have a chance to say something about what happens when these symmetries get broken at the quantum level. So that is, what happens when I start off with a classical symmetry and I quantize the theory, and that classical symmetry is lost in the quantum theory. So this is what we call an anomaly, um, and the study of anomalies, both local and global anomalies, are hugely important to quantum field theory and string theory, and um, we will touch on them once we're done with perturbation theory. So up until that point, pretty much everything that I'll have opportunity to talk about will be about bosons. So roughly speaking, just scalar particles. We won't even talk about gauge particles at this, um, in, in this course because um, that will take a whole other course by itself. Um, so we'll be talking right up until um, classical and quantum symmetries about um, bosons. Um, <clears throat> of course, um, at some point we will need to, to introduce the idea of fermionic particles, and I will do that um, in the section on fermions, and I'll show you that um, fermions are not as scary as, as, as one would think, um, and they're just a couple of minus signs that one needs to keep in mind, but otherwise, um, the, the, in, in many ways, the theory of fermions is a lot simpler than the theory with bosons, um, and, and um, we will comment a little bit about um, uh, how to compute path integrals with fermionic variables, which will necessitate us introducing the idea of um, uh, Grassmann variables, naturally non-commuting quantities, um, and how, um, how they can be coded in, in the Hilbert space of the fermion. And then, depending on how much time we have, um, I'd like to, I'd like to Kind of formally move into things that are that are directly relevant for string theory. So as I said, my, my philosophy on this is that string theory is an ultraviolet completion of quantum field theory, but it's a very particular type of quantum field theory itself. And this, I mean the following. A string is a one-dimensional object, and a one-dimensional object moving in space-time traces out a two-dimensional, what we call, world sheet. Now, the coordinates that embed the string in the space in which it's moving um, are viewed from the point of view of string theory as quantum fields living on this um, two-dimensional world sheet. And they're not just any old quantum fields, they're quantum fields that exhibit a certain class of symmetries. In fact, they're, they're sufficiently, um, sorry, the, the symmetries are sufficiently big, there's sufficiently many of these symmetries that it highly constrains the system. The class of symmetries that, um, that we're talking about here are what we call conformal symmetries. And the theory that lives in the string world sheet is what we call a conformal quantum field theory or conformal field theory. So once we're done with fermions, um, we'll have the opportunity to introduce some more advanced topics. And I will, at that point, probably give you a choice as to which of these advanced topics you would like to hear about. Some of them are um, conformal field theory, um, <clears throat> Um, the Ising model, um, uh, path integrals in, 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 in solitonic systems, for example, etc. So I will give you a set of topics and, and we'll take a poll in the class and see what you guys would like to, to hear about um, at the time. Okay. Any questions? Okay, so before we start, I'd like to I'd like to get to at least see who who I'm talking to beyond just the name on the on the screen. So, um, could we do a, a, a 
introduction around the table and just um, just so that we're all familiar with each other. Let's start with Anik. Yeah, I'm a student in University of Witwatersrand. Sand. I am doing, I'm just joined as a PhD student in string theory, and black hole in string theory. Good, thank you. Sebastian? Uh, yeah, hello, I'm Sebastian, not sure. Sorry, what was the introduction about? I... Just who you are and what your what year you are and what you're oh, what yeah. you're uh, yeah. working on. So I'm in honors five maths at UCT. I guess the uh, honors project I'm doing with Professor Morgan here is sort of chaotic solitons of the sign. Great. Thank you. Uh, Sergio. Hi, good day, guys. Um, my name is Sergio. I'm I'm doing honors in applied maths, and my topic is on my I'm doing a, a, a my thesis with with the the Jaid or, or Sajid is basically on the um on the singularity theorems essentially. Oh, good, cool. Excellent. Good to hear. And uh, Nitin. So, hi, everyone. I have just joined Jeff for a PhD at UCT, and uh, I'll be working on information dynamics in quantum many body networks. And yes, that's it for me. Thank you. Great. Excellent. All right. So let's um, let's let's start with today's lecture. Um, um, <clears throat> and. I want to I want to start by thinking about the progression from um, integrals that you're familiar with to path integrals. Um, so by way of a by way of a um, of a review, we'll start off and just think a little bit about um, uh, quantum mechanics and just some very very basic things about quantum mechanics. Um, and from there, we this will lead us to ideas about um, observable quantities, in particular probabilities and amplitudes in quantum mechanics. Um, <clears throat> and then I'll show you how we can compute um, the probability amplitude by summing over paths. So this was Feynman's big, uh, big insight, um, essentially for his PhD, um, in realizing that quantum mechanics could be thought of as a generalization of the principle of least action um, uh, and you would end up computing a similar kind of um, functional integral uh, to extract observable quantities in quantum mechanics. So the way I'd like to start each section is to just think a little bit about um, a physical question. Now, the physical question that I pose might not seem like it's related to anything that we're going to be working on, but I promise you it is. And I'd like, to, I'd like you to keep it in mind as we're, as we're going along. Um, and we'll eventually get to it and I'll show you exactly how it ties into all of the things that we're talking about um, in, in, in the lectures. So the question I'd like you to think about, you don't have to answer it right now, you don't even have to, to, to answer it at any point, but we will get to it at some point. I'd just like it to ferment a little bit in the background. <clears throat> and the question I'd like to ask is, is the following. So, you know, nature, as we encounter, it seems to consist of two types of particles. There are things that make up um, forces, Electromagnetic, strong, nu uh, strong nuclear, weak nuclear, um, gravity. All of these things seem to, to, to be related to bosonic particles. Particles that satisfy Bose-Einstein statistics. Um, on the other hand, there are the particles, the electrons, protons, uh, hadrons, leptons, um, everything in the standard model, um, except the bosons, that constitute matter. And these are fermionic particles. These are particles that, that obey Fermi Dirac statistics on the other hand, right? And they're, they're, they're different things altogether. Um, and the question I would like to ask is what makes a boson a boson? So it's, it's, it's all well and good to say they satisfy the, the Bose-Einstein statistics, but what does that mean exactly, practically speaking? What does it mean for a fermion to satisfy Fermi-Dirac statistics, practically speaking? 
Um, you might say, well, fermion satisfied the Pauli exclusion principle, but I would argue that the Pauli exclusion principle is a consequence of something deeper. We'd like to expand what that something deeper is and just how deep can we go? That's question one. The second question I would like to ask in this context is, are, this, are these the only possibilities? Can we only have bosons and fermions? If so, why? Um, and then related to that question, I would like to ask if these are not the only possibilities and there is something else, what does that something else have to do with the future of computers? And you might guess that I'm talking about um, the idea of quantum computers here. Because the question is, what do all of these notions about fermions and bosons have to do with quantum computers? Okay, <clears throat> so that's just something for you to think about and we will return to it um, a little later in the, in the course. So to start off with, I wanna talk about, um, I wanna think about something very, what should be quite familiar to you. And this is a problem of a quantum particle moving in zero plus one dimensions. So we wanna talk about quantum mechanics to start off with. Okay, so in particular, we're going to be thinking about single particle quantum mechanics. And quantum mechanics, as I said, I'm going to view as a quantum field theory in zero plus one dimension. Zero plus one dimensions, the one dimension there is time. So my variables are just going to depend on time as for, this, for the start of this, this course, okay? And I'd like to ask the following question. I would like to ask, suppose I have a particle single quantum particle that starts at some position x naught at time t equals naught, and then evolves under the Hamiltonian. <clears throat> um, and we'll write the Hamiltonian in the kind of canonical way as the sum of a kinetic part and a potential part. So I'm not really going to need the potential at this point, but let's just write it down in any event. Um, so this is the potential term, and this is the kinetic term, okay? And the P here is the canonically conjugate momentum that you're all familiar with from classical mechanics. And I wanna ask, what is the probability, technically, what is the probability amplitude that this particle um, that starts off at time t equals zero, at position x naught will end off at some other point, x prime say, at time t equals capital T, okay? What I wanna do is make this question precise. And in order to make the question precise and actually calculate this probability amplitude, we're going to need to introduce some, um, some objects. In particular, I'm going to introduce the wave function of the particle which encodes the dynamical content of the, of the quantum particle. And I'm going to, to have to think of this wave function as a vector in some Hilbert space. And if I'm thinking about vectors in a Hilbert space, I'd like to have some basis in which to expand these vectors. And that basis, is, well, there are going to be a couple of different bases we're gonna use, but I'm gonna introduce just one um, to start off with. And the basis I'm going to introduce is the basis of position eigenstates. The so position eigenstates are eigenstates, as the name suggests, of the position operator. So in this expression here, um, x is a position operator acting on some vector to produce a number times the vector itself. Okay, so we're talking about an eigenvalue problem um, and the operator in question is the position operator and it acts on a vector and the vector in question is the position eigenstate that we're interested in. Good. Um, <clears throat> now for this, um, for, these, for this set of vectors to be a useful set of objects for me to use, um, they need to satisfy some properties. And one of the properties that they satisfy is the property of orthonormality. This is the statement that if I take the inner product between X and X prime, then it produces a delta function, a direct delta function, because these are continuous variables. Um, and um, we're going to be using that um, in many, many times as, it, as we go along. Another thing we're gonna be using many, many times as we go along is the idea that I can take the identity operator, this guy, 
one, I'm denoted here, and I can expand the identity operator in this uh, in this set of eigenstates. If I can do this, if I can write the um, outer product of x with x integrated over all x variables, and that gives me the identity operator, then I say that this basis is complete. Okay. These ideas are exactly the same ideas that you would have encountered in a in an introductory course um, in linear algebra, for example, except that we're not dealing with a finite dimensional vector space, we're dealing with an infinite dimensional Hilbert space in this problem. The quantity we actually want to calculate, what we call the probability amplitude, is what I get if I start off, sorry, is what I get if I start off at position x, remember this was at time t equals naught, and then I evolve my state forward in time with the evolution operator, which is e to the minus i h t. So that takes my original state and it propagates it forward in time to some later time capital T. And I'm going to be use, using units of h bar equals one here, but typically when you see, um, when you see uh, <clears throat> quantities like e to the minus i h t, h is measured in units of uh, energy, um, t is measured in units of time. And so I need something that's measured in units of energy times time to cancel that off and give me a pure number in the exponential, in the argument of the exponential. And that, that object that has units of um, uh, energy times time is precisely Planck's constant h bar divided by two pi. So Planck's constant divided by two pi, which is what we call h bar. So when I say I'm working in units of h bar equals one, in this case, I'm measuring energy in the units of inverse time. Okay, so what we do is we start off with our initial state we propagate that state forward in time e to the minus with the operator e to the minus i h t. And then I project it onto the final state. Okay. So this is the wave function that I get. Um, this is the wave function that I get when I um, propagate my initial state forward in time. And this inner product here is the projection. So this is the projection onto the final state. Which we've called x bar. So is this clear? The amplitude for this process is what I get when I start off with my initial state, propagate the initial state forward in time um, to some later time t, capital T, and then project that onto the final state, okay? And this quantity is what we're going to be calling um, k of x prime t, x and naught, meaning I start at x and naught, propagate it forward to x prime and t prime and k of x, prime t, x, and naught gives me the probability amplitude whose square is the probability for that, uh, for that particle to propagate from x at naught to x prime at t. If this looks familiar or sounds familiar to what you may have learned in your initial course on um, differential equations in which you studied Green's functions, it should. Because this particle propagator, we'll, we will show a little later, is intimately related to um, the Green's function for the same problem. That is to say, there, this Hamiltonian evolution occurs um, in the context of some differential equation, right? That differential equation in this case is the Schrodinger equation. And I use the Schrodinger equation to propagate the system forward in time. Well, if I solve for the Green's function associated to the Schrodinger operator, I will get precisely this particle propagator. Does this make sense? Yes. Great. Cool. Um, and 
just following on what I what I said um, in my course um, yesterday, for those of you who were there, I like to have a very interactive course. Um, I don't particularly have any particular goal I'm trying to reach, you know, curriculum wise with this course. So it's important that what I do say you understand, and the way to understand it is to ask questions. So feel free to ask questions, to, to raise your hand and ask questions at any point, and I'll do my best to um, to answer them. Okay. Very good. So let's move on then. And you'll notice also that that um, um, in the absence of an actual physical blackboard, I'm doing my best to simulate it um, with an, in an online kind of uh, way. Right. So hence the hence the, uh, the the blackboard and the and the writing. Good. So. Given this, then, <clears throat> let's see what we can say about, let's see what we can say about um, this, this object, the propagator K, okay? The first thing I'd like to say is that the physics of the system should not depend on, um, the physics of the system should not depend on the choice of location of the origin. Okay, so physics should be independent of what we call the origin. Okay. In other words, this translates to the propagator being invariant under a constant time shift. So K should be independent. Let's put that on the next line. So this means that this propagator that we're talking about, K, should be symmetric under a constant shift of the time coordinate. So K of X prime T and X at naught should be the same as K of X prime T plus some amount, some fixed amount, little t and X at T. Okay, so I started off my particle at time T equals zero, but I could have started it off at any time T as long as I shift the whole problem by um, that amount t. Okay, so this is the statement that the propagator is invariant under time shifts. Okay. <clears throat> so, go for it. So, uh, quantum mechanically, uh, only the modulus is uh, uh, the physically observable quantity, right? Mm -hmm. so wow. Well, okay. <laughs> that's a that's a that's a question that must be answered with a caveat. But fine. Let's just go with your question. Geometric phases are our counterexample to that question, but okay, let's just go with your question. But uh, like, uh, shouldn't we say that uh, the modulus of K is, should be the independent of choice of origin instead of K only? Ah, ah, ah. okay, very good. Um, so no, so I, I am going to keep this a general statement like this because I do want to explore a circumstance where it's not the case. And that circumstance would be precisely in um, uh, the case of um, what we would, I guess, normally call geometric phases, but um, it's when we get to talk about the Arano Bohm effect. All right, but like, what's our motivation to 
keep the k as independent of choice of a reason i mean one would like if one is trying to build a theory one would expect that it's not k it's rather the k into k star or uh, mod k which is independent right right um sure yes agreed um Uh, and another thing that's bugging me a little is that we are in zero plus one dimensions. Yeah. So does that not mean our particle cannot evolve in in x direction or any physical space? It can only move in time space. Right, right, right. So all I mean um, by the zero plus one dimensions in this case is that I am considering just everything's just depending on 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 time. So I'm going to use x here as a as a as a uh, nominal placeholder for where to put the particle at some later time. That's, but you shouldn't think about it as a particle propagating in time, in space. Okay, okay, got it. Okay, so with the first question, I will concede on that. And I will say that we can put a constraint on the modulus then of K. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Very good. Um, good. So to get a concrete expression for the amplitude, we're going to need to break up the amplitude. The, the, okay. So, 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 Nitin, let me, let me, let me, let me address your second question again. So everything I'm about to say, Applies perfectly well for fun for for particles in d plus one dimensions, where x becomes a, a an actual um, position in, in a d plus one dimensional space. Right here, I'm interested just in the case where all my dependence, the only independent variable in the problem, is time. Okay, I see. Okay. Um, so, for us to get a concrete expression for this propagator K um, of X prime and t, x, and naught. Um, we're going to do what you would have done in first year calculus when you learned how to compute integrals, in that we're going to break up the interval into smaller pieces and hope that we can evaluate um, the integral on each of the smaller pieces. In this case, evaluating the integral on the smaller pieces amounts to writing down an integral representation for the propagator on that small piece. So we're going to break up um, the interval from um, zero to t into the interval into an interval from from zero to let's say t1 and t1 through to capital T. Okay. And now we can evaluate the propagator um, on each piece. So let's go ahead and do that. So the propagator A is by our definition of what it of what the propagator is, the e to the i h t. Um, x and I'm breaking up the interval into two smaller pieces so that I propagate from, from x to e to the minus i h t1 and then from that point 
the rest of the way. Is that clear? Yes. Good. And now comes the trick. And the trick is really um, recognizing that I can insert um, an identity in between these two operators. And I can expand the identity in what's called a resolution of the identity using the um, completeness relation. Yeah. Okay. So that's what we're going to do. And let's see what it evaluates to. So this is then um, x prime e to the minus i h t minus t1 integral um, overall x one x one x one. I should do that in another, in another line, sorry. Okay, I need more space. So this is x prime e to the minus i h t minus t1. Um, Integral over x1, x1, outer product x1, e to the minus i h t1, x. Okay. Um, and then I can always take the integral outside of the expression because nothing to the left of the expression involves any x1s. So this is the integral over x1 of x prime e to the minus i h t minus t1 x1 x1 e to the minus i h t1 x which if you look at it is nothing but the product of the two subpropagators from x to x1 um, and then x1 to x prime. Okay, is the manipulation that I've done here clear? Yes. Great, Sebastian, Sergio, you're happy with this? I'm happy, I'm prof. Good, good, yeah. excellent. But this statement is nothing but the statement of how amplitudes combine. If a particle propagates from X naught at from x naught to uh, at time t equals zero to x prime at t, then it must pass through some intermediate point um, in x t space x one t one, say. And the total amplitude is computed as an integral over all possible intermediate times. So that's really what the what the statement um, is telling us. So the total amplitude. is um, an integral over all possible intermediate amplitudes. Okay. And this gives us a strategy 
for how we approach a concrete expression for, for um, the propagator. And that concrete expression will have to come by repeating this story n times, as you did in the in the case of um, you, you know when you first computed when you first computed an integral using um, using um, a sum over parallelograms. You took you were trying to calculate an area under a curve. What you did was you took the the interval from A to B. You broke it up into a bunch of tiny little intervals, and you broke up broke it up into intervals that were small enough that the smooth curve became well approximated by a series of parallelograms and you could calculate the area of, the, of each parallelogram, add them up, and then you take some limit um, in which the number of parallelograms and their width, um, well, the number of parallelograms became infinite, their width went to zero, but the product of those two things remained fixed. And that's, that's going to be exactly our strategy um, to, to get a formal expression for, um, for the, the propagator. So if we're going to continue this then, so what we want to do is continue this. Um, so continuing, um, let's say n times where n is some large number and we break up the interval from zero to t into intervals of length epsilon and each in, um, each interval would um, have uh, each interval would have length epsilon epsilon is t divided by n so let's repeat this n times with intervals of uniform length uh, epsilon, which I'm going to define to be total time interval divided by n. And I'm going to assume that um, I choose n sufficiently large that um, this is epsilon is small. Well, in that case, what I'm going to find is that my amplitude A is X prime E to the minus I H epsilon. So this is time evolution um, from each time evolution from uh, ti to ti plus epsilon. And I have to do this n times in taking the state x to the state x prime. Okay. And then we just repeat what we just did. So what we just did was to insert an identity in between each of the time evolutions and then resolve the time evolution at that point. In other words, um, this is this is x prime e to the minus i h epsilon. And then I insert. Um, let's let's organize this properly. So n minus one x n minus one x and minus one um, e to the minus i h epsilon and I keep doing this until I get to um, until I get to the integral dx1 x1 x1 e to the minus i h epsilon <clears throat> x. Okay. We then. Uh, shouldn't it be n instead of n minus one? Sorry? Shouldn't it be like dx n 
and outer product of x n instead of uh, n minus one. No. Because if n equals one, then there is no like there is no resolution there, right? But in if the I choose n equals one, oh, um. Uh, yeah okay sorry this has to do with my labeling um and my labeling was basically going from zero to n so going from zero yeah. to one has an x one and then one to two has an x uh has an x two and x prime is going to be at x n i'll show you what i mean just just yeah, bear with yeah, yeah. i got it i got it thank you okay um so uh right good so then i then i pull the integrals out this will be integral x n minus one through to integral x one um and then each of these guys e to the minus i h epsilon x n minus one x x n minus one um in fact let's not do that and this will go all the way down through to x one e to the minus i h epsilon x x okay each of these guys is um one of the propagators and so this is this is the integral over x one through to x n minus one k x n t n x n minus one t n minus one through to k at x one t one x naught t naught so now Nitin, you can see why i chose to label um, things the way i did i'm going to call this guy um x prime or rather i'm going to call x prime xn and x naught um we'll call x okay and t naught in my previous um writing was uh naught and tn was t so with this relabeling I can write it in a uniform way. And the reason I want to write it in a uniform way is because um, when I'm actually having to carry out these integrals, I need to, uh, it will be very useful to write it in a uniform way. So the point I'd like you to, to take away from this is that the structure the structure is important and the structure in this case says that a my amplitude takes the form of a sum over all paths joining x naught t naught to x n t n and i have to sum over all of the paths of course what i mean by sum is not usually what you would mean by a sum in this case the sum over paths is the corresponds to taking this integral dx1 through dx n minus one and this guy the amplitude the sub amplitude over each path it corresponds to 
this corresponds to the product of um, sub propagators xn, tn, xn minus one, tn minus one. Okay. And this is important. This is what we're going to need to um, evaluate um, and, and make precise. There are many things that we need to make precise. For example, I haven't really told you what the uh, measure on that integral is. Um, and this is something that we will you know, evaluate next time. Okay, good. So I want to, I want to stop here for, for today. We've set up the problem we need to solve. We need to figure out what we mean by um, this product. Uh, well, we need to figure out what we mean exactly by the, the propagator. Um, so we need to pick a specific system, let's say a free particle, um, write down the actual propagator for this thing, um, and then work out what the integral measure is, and then actually carry out the, integra uh, the integration to, to get um, a concrete expression for um, the probability amplitude. Is that clear? Yes. Good. Any questions? No, Sebastian. Uh, sorry, I we've had some water leaks, so I've sort of been like running in that. Sorry, I can't hear you. You're cutting out. Sorry. Is it like somewhat all right? Uh, I'm getting like every second or third word. I don't know if, if this is the same for the rest of you guys. Can you hear Sebastian? It's just me. Uh, you seem to miss it in the, in the chat, um, Prof. Okay. Uh, okay, he's, he's typing. I will wait for that. In the meantime, I'm going to stop sharing and I'm going to stop recording. Um.